so I will be speaking about uh, planning and reasoning. If I can get the mouse under control again. Is that okay right now? Yes. Okay, great. Maybe like that. Okay, cool. Uh, I'll be speaking uh, broadly about planning and reasoning and hopefully uh, building on the great talk by Claire on RL and leading towards uh, the following talk on RLHF by Danielle. So um, the talk will have two parts. I would say, roughly speaking, the pre-LLM era, so the fundamentals of planning. So a uh, doubting question like, what is planning? Uh, some notions of explicit and implicit planning. And then for the second half, we'll talk about reasoning in LLMs. Uh, focusing in particular on chain of thought, prompting strategies, self-improvement, uh, planning with LLM, and talk briefly about uh, limitation. So for the purpose of the talk, um, there will be uh, equations and stuff, but I don't want you to get stuck on the equations or even on the details. I'm doing kind of a review of particular papers, and what I want you to get out of each review is really the the main idea, the principles, the, the design pattern that is used in the algorithm. And then if you really grok how at a high level, if you remove the details, how an algorithm works, then it, new papers in the space appear much less surprising. It just feels like, oh, it just, there is a couple of fundamental ideas, and if I combine them appropriately, up, you know, new paper, new idea, and it, it just makes it much easier to understand the literature, which can appear daunting at first because there are so many papers published every day on, on planning and in particular on reasoning and LM. All right, so this being said, let's get started on the first part, fundamentals. Uh, and to begin, we'll, we'll start a slightly more uh, high level uh, discussing what is planning. Um, it turns out that you know, often people disagree uh, on the, word, the meaning of the word planning, and so there's arguments, and it's like this paper is about planning, it's not really planning, and so on. There's many definitions. Uh, the first one I would say is the informal definition, the one that you get from Wikipedia that says, planning is a process of thinking regarding the activities required to achieve a desired goal. Planning is based on foresight, the fundamental capacity for mental time travel. All right, so here this is kind of the everyday definition of planning. I'm planning a vacation and I need to think ahead about everything that I need to do to this vacation. Buy plane tickets, book a hotel, decide on what I'm gonna do and so on. In, I would say, classical or symbolic AI, it's very connected to the notion of search. So this is a def definition from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy and it says, slightly reformulated, in an AI planning problem, an agent in an initial world state is equipped with a set of actions, which are thought of as partial functions transforming world states into other world states. Actions are feasible only in world states that meet appropriate constraints, and a planning problem becomes a search for a series of feasible actions that successively transform the initial world state into a desired world state. So this is a mouthful. Um, the simplest example that I can give, if you know, is the problem of Towers of Hanoi. Probably most people know the Towers of Noise, three poles and a bunch of disks, and you want to move all the disks to another one, but there's a rule that you cannot put a disk on top of a smaller disk. And so here the world state is where are my disks currently? The action is to take a disk and move it to another pole. There is a constraint, which is you cannot move a disk to a smaller disk. And the goal state is to move one of the stacks to another stack. And so this has kind of a very symbolic flavor to it of saying, I have a set of kind of logical constraint about, and I, there is a desired end goal, and I just try to search over the state of possible action until I reach my end goal. The notion of planning in RL and in model-based RL is related, but I would say it's a bit uh, more general. I am borrowing here the definition of, of uh, Sutton Barto, the RL textbook, which actually I, I quite like, it's quite general. Uh, and it says, models can be used to mimic or simulate experience. And given a starting state and an action, a model could produce possible transition and in turn simulate an entire episode. So we use the term planning to refer to any computational process that takes the model as an input and produces or improves a policy for interacting with the model environment. So the fundamental kind of gist of planning in, in model based RL is essentially to say, if I have a model, I can interact with it in simulation. I can not act in the real world, which where the rewards are real. You know, if I burn myself, I burn myself for real, but I can act in my mind and anticipate possible actions and then basically do RL in uh, synthetic data generated from a model. And I have a last definition, which is behavioral, that um, I learned from David Silver, my, my manager. I'm not sure if, if it's from him. I think it is. And this is, uh, I think, my favorite because it's the most flexible one. Um, and David says, learning is a process that improves decision given an increased amount of experience. So the more data, the better you are, that's learning. Planning is a process that improves decision given an increased amount of thinking, which is computation. So you don't have new data, but you think harder about it. All right, now we're gonna go through our first case study, uh, which is uh, AlphaGo. So as you probably know, uh, Go is 
an ancient game. It's been played for over 2,000 years. It's a zero-sum, two-player game. Uh, zero-sum means that if one player wins, the other loses. Uh, and it's played on 19 by 19 board and has, I would say, quite simple rules. It doesn't take long for someone to learn the rules of Go, but yet in spite of the simplicity of the rules, extremely complex patterns emerge when you play Go and you learn to play it well, which is why you can basically learn to play Go for your entire life and you know, still learn new things. Uh, and until AlphaGo, it was considered very challenging for computers. A great part of this is that the number of states is massive, more than 10 to the 170. As d used to like to say, more than number of atoms in the universe. And so that makes kind of classical search method or RL very difficult. Um, that before AlphaGo, uh, there were bots, some not fantastic bots, but there were bots which were strong, just not uh, grandmaster level. And planning was a key ingredient of this bust. RL was arguably not. Okay, so why do we want to plan in Go? Uh, so here I have a picture of a game. I usually tend to use the color purple to mean real experience and blue for imagined or simulation. So I have a sequence of board moves and I'm at this state, I'm player black and I'm trying to decide what's my next move. So I don't know what to do. Uh, so you could say, why, why not just do RL and use a policy or a queue function? So I'm, as I said, I'm building a lot of, of, the, of the principles that Claire explained very nicely in her talk. So we could say, okay, I have some function approximator of the action given the state. A is the action, X is the state of the board. Have some theta, same thing for the Q function. And historically, that was a little too weak. Um, and the difficulty is that there is a very large number of states, as I mentioned, and so learning the right function sort of forces you to visit a lot of these states. And this is just very difficult. Another difficulty is that uh, it doesn't lend itself too well. There's a caveat to that because we will do that some. To, uh, function approximation because the map from the board, which is the state to the optimal action, is very unsmooth. So you can have a board where you're going to win the game. And if you could just, just change one stone, or your opponent could change just one stone, would definitely win the game. Like you could have a fight. And the way it is is that you're going to win the fight. But if someone removed one stone, they would completely flip the direction, which means that in a sense, the output, which is you try to predict the optimal action, or whether you're going to win or not, is going to change as a function of a single bit flip of the board configuration. So that makes it hard to learn very smooth function, uh, which tend to be the case for you know, linear function approximation or deep neural networks. All right, so what is the essence of tree search? I'm going to try to give you a very quick primer of how to do tree search in Go. This is not MCTS yet. I will go to MCTS in a second. This is, I would say, vanilla tree search. The essence of tree search has two components. The first one is, we, only, we use, in this case, a perfect simulator to consider a tree of possible future. Because we're not forced to do model free, where I can only play one game and not really consider what would have happened if I did this, this, or that, and in this case, I have a simulator, I can consider different possible futures. So this is the initial uh, position. Very simple three by three uh, game of Go, uh, where black has to play. And it can consider, there is a, a couple of moves that black would consider and lead it to this three distinct position where black has moved here, there, and there. OK, so then it's, I can imagine what white would do and play these three positions. There might be more. I just don't have the space for the whole tree and the picture. And this ends up with these nine board, which are two steps ahead. All right, so that's just building a tree. I haven't said yet. The second part, which is then we need to use the tree to infer what could be a good solution at the root, because that's where I am right now. And I'm not here. I'm imagining this. I'm imagining this. But this is where I am right now. This is the the move I'm expected to play against my opponent. All right, so let's think about what we could do here. Let's pretend that for a second, from each of these positions, I had some kind of oracle that told me what would happen if I played from that board onward. So for instance, maybe, this is completely random, I have no idea if this is true, but from this board, I mean, this is three by three, we go is meaningless, but uh, if I played from this point onward, I wouldn't win the game. So this is a good state to be in. And this one, is a bad one, I would typically lose because this is a weak position. Probably not true, it doesn't matter. Um, in reality, there is not one possible game from these things because they're not terminal nodes, so there's multiple games that could be played. So instead of having this hard notion of a reward of one for success or reward of minus one for defeat, I'm gonna have something that is gonna be very much like a value function, which is what is my expected probability of winning. Or because I did one and minus one, it's two P minus one, but that's a detail. You can choose anything you want as long as the rewards are different. Um, so I, I have these different colors for, you know, from this board, it's like, oh, green means likely to win, red means likely to lose, and this pale yellow is eh, in between. Okay, so now I put myself in the shoes of the white player, 
and white wins if I lose. These colors are referring to black, which is me. Um, so white thinks, uh, well, I want him to lose. So if I was in that board, I definitely don't want to choose that move because it's going to win. So I'm going to choose this axe, this, this transition. And if I was in that board, because I don't know what white is going to find itself in, it would play this move. And this one, they're sort of the same, but this is maybe the weakest one. So this is what you'd find. Um, so you have, for each of these nodes, you've decided what the transition should be for my opponent. And then I backtrack. So basically, I say, OK, now I know what the value of that node. Because if I'm here, I know my opponent's going to play this. And this is going to lead to me losing. So I have now this red dot here that says, this state has a bad value. But this state has a bad value for the same reason as this state has a neutral value. And so now, from my perspective, I want to choose the best action. I want to win. So I want to choose the brightest, greenest color. And so I choose this transition. And so the second part of the essence of tree search is to tr use a tree to inform a decision at the root, which is the decision point I am at currently. All right. So however, uh, why is, how do we do this? Well, there are uh, two big unknowns here. One is, well, you know, here I gave you an oracle for these colors, but where do they come from? How do we estimate the value of the leaves of the tree? It's infeasible to roll out the game until the end um, because the branching factor is too high. Uh, and the second point I just mentioned is go as a very large branching factor. So I cannot build the tree exhaustively. This will not work. It's impossible. So I have to be clever. So the, the fundamental idea of AlphaGo search. It's not real? Okay. I will imagine. Okay, good. Um, so the fundamental, there's two ideas in AlphaGo search. The first one is to use deep neural networks to approximate the value function. So this is going to be very similar to what Claire described. And the only difference is that we use a deep neural network versus a tabular or linear function approximation. Deep, deep learning for RL might sound scary, but it is really no different from RL and just a different function approximator. Theoretically, it's scary because you lose all the guarantees you had. Algorithmically, I would say it's not fundamentally different. Empirically, you have to learn the tricks that make it work. But the methods, they don't feel that different from the regular RL method. So we're going to do something like regression on the Monte Carlo return. We wait until to see if I win the game or not, and then just regress against that value. I'll mention a bit more. Now, I don't want to explore the whole tree. I want to be adapted. I want to, so I want to do the transition where they matter. And so for that, we're going to have to guide the search by a policy prior, which is going to be just a policy in your network, by using an adaptive exploration algorithm called PUCT. Don't worry about the details of PUC. I'm going to tell you what the equation is. But again, what matters is the, the intuition. All right, so how does Monte Carlo tree search work? How much time do I have? I have to have some time to explain MCTS. Um, so every node in the tree X stores some information. It stores a visit count. How many times have I been through that node? It stores the policy and the value prior. So these are the outputs of a neural network. These are You compute them once, and you store them forever. There's the policy that tells you what the neural network thinks is a good move, and what the value is, which is basically, uh, are you going to win or not from the neural network's point of view? And this value is not updated. But during the search, we update an empirical posterior value, which is, well, after thinking about it, after doing all that computation of the tree, I've updated my value from the prior, v theta, to a posterior value, vp. And I'm going to tell you how this is done. So AlphaGo repeats three phases. The first one is called traversal. And we start from the root, and we branch according to a formula. And that formula is here. So we repeat, and we start from the root, and we repeat until we reach an unexpanded node, a node which is not currently in the tree. So this dotted line here means this node is not in a tree. I may consider it, but it's not there. And so, OK, so what do I want? It's basically like true learning with a little exploration reward. So I know that I'm considering all my children, which are equivalent to an action, and I want to win, so I want the child to lose. And so I do a minus here. I look at the value of the child node. I want them to lose, so I'm going to do minus. This is only because we're doing a two-player two zero-sum zero game. Otherwise, it would be just a plus or a discount. You can think if. This is helpful. Two players, zero sum games are the same as regular RL with a discount of minus one. Because what's good for me is bad for my opponent. So the discount of minus one makes sure that what's bad for my opponent is good for me and vice versa. All right, so I choose the no If I was just doing vanilla tutoring, so to speak, I would just take the argmax of minus VP of X prime. That would be like the Sarsa, you know, greedy approach. So I want to choose the action that maximally makes my opponent lose. But then I say, OK, maybe I need to make sure that I don't always spend the time in the same part of the tree. I need to explore some moves that I haven't considered, like the famous move 37 or 47, I forget, 37, I think. Uh, you know, probably doesn't come from the prior, but from saying, OK, I'm going to try a move that is maybe slightly contrary to my prior says is not completely likely. And so we get this 
we guide the search by the prior, but also by a score, which is an expulsion cost. And so I'll, I'll go through each term. So again, this one, this term is a probability the child lose, probability the player wins. This is a prior of what a good action is. So I'm going to tell you where to learn that, but there's a network that says, you know, I think without knowing too much, I think this is where I think you should expand. And this term here is a UCT expulsion formula, and it's higher for expulsion for unexplored children. So if a child has not been explored, you trust the prior. And if you explore it a lot, you're going to trust the value function because the value function is the only thing we're going to refine through the search. OK, so details, again, matters not too much. What matters is that we use effectively RL in a tree, and then we explore until we get to a node. Once we reach a new node, we do an expansion. And this is the only time we call the neural network. Says, so OK, I've never really been in that state for real, so I'm going to call, I'm going to add X to the tree, and I'm going to compute the, view, the neural network prior for the policy and for the value function. And I'm going to initialize the value to 1 for the visit count. And my posterior value is initialized at the prior. It says, you know, so far, I think my best estimate for whether I'm going to win or not is whatever the neural network tells me. And the last bit is the backup. And so now I visit, now I've decided I visited that node, and I have a slightly better estimate of whether I'm going to win or lose in that position. And this should inform all the parents, because the parents led to that node. And so I increase their visit count by 1, because I'm more certain about their value, because I've thought I spent more computation to think about those nodes. So this is the increase of visit count. And the second term is I move the posterior value towards uh, the value function of the leaf. So I have a new node. I think about it some within your network. It gives me a slightly new estimate of whether I'm going to win or lose that game. And that value is transmitted all through the parent, saying, well, I think you, know, you thought you were going to win. Your value was high. But I looked a bit deeper into the tree and deeper into the tree, closer to the end of the game, where I'm more confident I actually think you're going to lose. So every parent needs to be like, you thought you were on a path to winning, but now every parent needs to know you're on a path to losing on that path, and so maybe you need to explore another part of the tree. Does that make some level of sense so far? So that's MCTS. It's a kind of gnarly algorithm, but the fundamental idea is we build a tree progressively, and we do effectively what looks like RL on the tree as opposed to a sequence. OK. At the end of the search, though, we need to finally act. I've built this whole complicated tree, and I need to decide, well, I'm, I'm not going to act according to the prior, but otherwise nothing new happens. I already had the prior, so I need to be better than the prior. I need to use my search. And the intuition you get is that, based on the PUCT formula, the children that are most visited represent the best actions. They are the ones that we think are leading to successful outcomes. So we take those visit counts for the children of the root node. I apply a temperature, and I do a softmax, and I sample according to that. And so that policy, I will call the posterior policy, it's only computed at the end of the search. So unlike the value posterior, which is updated throughout the search, this is computed just at the end. All right, so this is AlphaGo. In AlphaGo, the policy prior was learned by imitating human data. How can we do this without any human data? Entirely by self-play. So how do we go from AlphaGo to Alpha0? So how to learn, in particular, the two commons, V theta of x and pi theta, from scratch and not from imitation? So the first component is self-play. The agent is going to play against itself. And it's going to keep getting better and eventually play high-level games, starting from not knowing anything about the game at all, except the rules. And every complete game, even though initially they're low quality, uh, creates a sequence of states for which we know the final outcome. There is only a terminal reward in Go is you lose or you win. And so you can regress. The multi color return of a game is whether you win or lose. And so you can regress, using nl 2 loss, the value against that outcome. So that's it. It's very simple. See if you win, and try to predict that number. And then on average, you're going, to you're going to predict the average, which is going to be how often do I win from that state onwards. And that's going to change as the agent gets better, right? Because it's not a stationary thing. The policy keeps changing. The agent gets better. So its estimate of value changes out throughout training. So that's the policy. Um, the second bit, which is a bit more subtle, is for every state of the game, we also have an improved policy uh, that comes from planning. So as I said, this kind of posterior policy that looks at the visit count is better priori, hopefully, than a prior. Otherwise, there is no point in doing the search. If it was not better, then you should just act opening for the prior. And so what we're going to do is to regress the parametric neural network policy towards pi p. So this is just a cross entropy. And we say, I want this policy. This is kind of classical term for supervised learning. I want my parametric policy to approximate the actions that the tree policy would have taken. And I do a gradient update on that. And so it makes it boost the level of the prior policy. So famously, Alpha Zero works uh, very well. It's reached Grandmaster level and defeated all the Go Grandmaster, um, Lisido in that case. 
Uh, and you can see here uh, a curve that, you know, it overtakes the super, initially it's weaker, of course, because the initial games are very bad. This is the ELO on the y-axis and the x-axis of the training time. So initially it's weak because there's not a learning signal from playing bad games, but eventually the games get better and better and better, and eventually you overtake quite significantly supervised learning. All right, so if I wanted to think about MCTS abstracted for a second, one way to think about it is that it is a policy improvement operator. So we have a parametric policy, pi theta, it's parameterized by a neural network, and then have some kind of complicated operator called MCTS that outputs a new policy, but that one is not parametric, right? It's, I know it for specific states, but not for all the states. I know it for the states I have seen through my search. And the assumption is that the value of the posterior policy is better than the value of the prior. And one way to think about the system is that this is a student, right? well, except the student and expert are gonna be the same person, but this is a student. This is an expert, and then we're going to do self-distillation or policy improvement, or so-called expert iteration of saying, well, student, look more like your expert. Or if I was going to, from an introspective point of view, I'd like to, my gut reaction, which is my prior, to look more like the reaction I, I, I have when I've thought about it a lot. And so this kind of self-distillation is the flywheel that makes the policy improve over and over and over again. So this is the fundamental self-improvement technique of MCTS. All right, so if I abstract a little bit further, um, one way to think about planning, which I'm quite partial forwards, towards, is planning as local reinforcement learning. So we're in a state X, and we want to compute the optimal action in that state, and we have access to a simulator. So we can consider a new MDP, which I call the local MDP, where the initial state, the initial state distribution is X, and the transitions come from the simulator. And we can apply any RL algorithm to that MDP, and I, I, that I have a simulator, so I can do as many trajectories as I want. And because they are effectively the same as the original MDP except for the starting distribution, the optimal distribution in a simulator for state X is the same as the original one. So one way to think effectively about what MCTS is saying is there is some information that is global, that is true about, across all states, and that's the learning part. This is the priors. And there's some planning part, which is the local information that is about optimal policies for the current state. So there's this kind of global versus local attention. The global stuff is, it's true on average. And when I plan, what I do is I razor focus my attention and my learning towards this particular situation I'm in to try to be better. And the simulator allows you to do this because it allows you to play the scenarios of where I am right now, what I'm about to say when I'm faced with a difficult question in an interview, what am I supposed to do when I'm playing a difficult move in Go. So I, I stop time and I play a virtual game in my head and I apply an RL algorithm because RL is valid. And eventually, I converge to a better policy, and that's the one I actually take in the real world. Um, so to kind of do the, the clear uh, analogy here, the global knowledge is v theta pi theta of x. I can create on any state, and it's pretty good across all states, but it's not perfect. The local information that I keep updating during MCTS is the tree with the value posterior, the visit counts, and the prior. And the R algorithm, in a sense, is a tabular state values, because that's what the tree does. Every, value has its, every state has its own value. I initialize the state values at the prior, and I update by Monte Carlo average, which is kind of the most basic algorithm we have. It's like Monte Carlo average, tabular value function. And the only trick, I guess, is that it's not a greedy policy, it's a pi UCT. And this local RL is applied on simulated experience. So can we come up with alternatives? I'll very quickly go through, yeah, one or two. Uh, the first one is policy gradient search, Well, we say, Claire presented policy gradient at the end. Policy gradient search is an algorithm that is easier to implement than MCTS. It's a bit more computationally heavy. The main idea is to say, okay, I have a global knowledge, which is a pi theta and a v theta. And when I want to plan, I make a copy of theta into theta local. I'm not going to change theta. And I just do policy gradient on synthetic data. We know this policy gradient works, so nothing prevents me from just doing rollouts and upgrading uh, my theta local on all these steps. And at the end, oops, well, that's the don't need to spend too much time on the equation, but this is just the policy gradient algorithm, grad log prob, the advantage and the value loss. We can skip that. And then if we repeat on multiple trajectory, eventually theta L converges to a better version. And so we can act according to P of theta L. But that theta L is very focused on this state. And as a result, it could become bad in other states. That's why I just toss it. And then I just keep acting for the next state and so on. Uh, Dyna2 is very similar. Uh, global knowledge is a Q function. Local information is theta L, a copy of theta, and then we do CTD on synthetic data. 
on the local parameters. And I repeat on multiple trajectories, same idea. So you see all these algorithms that look like very different if you read the paper, they have fundamentally the same underpinnings uh, that tie them together. All right, so I'm gonna skip the part about planning with learned models. I was not really planning to present it. You can, probably the slides will be made available. I will talk extremely briefly about implicit planning and then we're gonna move on to LLMs. All right, so let's step back for a moment. I said initially, planning is a process that improves decision given an increased amount of thinking and computation. And so far in AlphaGo, the computation was used to search to distinct states or to evaluate synthetic transitions. So it's a very particular way of using computation. It says, I'm just gonna simulate environment steps and maybe apply gradient. But of course, maybe you would think more generally, maybe there's other things that we can do. So I wanna, so this is what I would call explicit planning. And a question, uh, paradoxical, uh, controversial maybe, is that could we use the computation in a more free form emergent way, so to speak. So this is what I would call implicit planning. So let's think about any problem you want to solve. It doesn't have to be a plan, it doesn't have to be an RL problem, it could be a vision problem, it could be an LLM. Uh, I have a, let's consider a feed-forward architecture. I have an input, neural network, output. So by construction, the test time compute and the train time computes both grow with the model size. I have no way of saying at test time I want a better answer so spend more time computing. Well, no, no, the neural network is fixed. If I don't grow the test time compute, I need to grow the train time. But maybe that's not what I want to do, right? I really want to say, well, train as big of a model as I can get. But at test time, I want to give you a thousand hours to actually evaluate the best solution possible. So this is not possible with a regular foreign neural network. So how can we keep one constant and increase the other? So everyone knows probably about RNNs, recurrent architecture, where there's a state that gets updated. And so if you unroll it, it looks something like this, right? You have a sequence of input, a sequence of output. Probably everyone knows this in the context of kind of like uh, language decoding or stuff like that. But you could also use it for uh, iterative computation. So the design pattern here, we do iterative computation with recurrent architecture for planning in the activations. So we're gonna assume, as opposed to the classical RNN setup, that the input is actually always the same and the output is always the same. So I try to predict the output from this first input, but I also let myself tick the computation multiple times. So each RNN step is hopefully increasing the quality of prediction. And so the advantage is that somehow if you trust the RNN to have learned a useful algorithm at test test, you can enroll it more. You know, I can train it with one, two, five, ten steps at test time, maybe a hundred, who knows. Um, okay, so however, there is caveats to that. Increasing the number of tests at test time may not generalize. Maybe the, you know, maybe when it works well for 10 steps because that's what you train on. And when you do a hundred steps, well, it goes into crazy land because it has never seen a hundred steps of the RNN. Uh, and the training time requirements grow with the number of steps used for training. Um, all right, so how can we fix some of these issues? Uh, there is an unsung hero. It's not glamorous, and yet it's extremely powerful. It's truncated backprop through time. So truncated backprop through time is a very simple algorithm that says that instead of backpropagating through the whole chain, you just did it in chunk, and you sort of pretend that the gradients don't flow too far backward. So you pretend that your horizon is just a few steps. And Let's pretend that we, here there's only one, but pretend we only do a few steps at a time. So I basically do input, and I learn by you know, supervised learning to predict ORL, doesn't matter, to predict the output. And then, but I, you know, I don't really have a training signal for this yet, but I just have some information that I may pass forward. And you know, I do the gradient steps here. And the second step here, well, I have some side information that I can take into account if I feel like it. So now I predict the output, the same quantity, but from the input and an estimate maybe of how good, uh, you know, some, some information that is hopefully obviously useful because it predicted the output in the first place. And so then I can do a gradient descent on this and forward. And so you only do a few steps at a time, so this decreases the memory requirements and they can train a large number of steps which are chopped up. If you know a bit about diffusion model, this is not exactly this, but there's something similar happening in diffusion model that we don't train the, uh, the, the supervised loss of, or the, the generative model loss of diffusion is not trained in a whole sequence, but on chunks, because they would not hold into memory otherwise. Uh, and just to make an analogy with NCTS, it again has this notion of global and local. So the global part is the neural network parameters, but the local computations are the activations that keep getting refined into better, you know, better computation to support the prediction of the output. I'll give you three examples of paper doing this extremely briefly. One is in a, a paper called Adaptive Computation Time, where it's actually an LLM, but it allows all to, oh, it's an LLM, it's a, it's a language model, not large. And it's allowed to tick multiple time in the RNN. So if it feels like the next token or if the next word is hard to predict, the RNN can itself decide, I'm gonna compute more. So it, it takes a few times before actually outputting the distribution. And what they see is through training that uh, there's this notion of difficulty here and the bluer the curve, the further along in training it is. And initially the model does not know 
uh, how to use the multiple steps. But as training goes on, the model learns to actually start using more steps of computation for the harder questions. And it leads to better accuracy. Uh, another one is uh, a paper called An Investigation of Model-Free Planning by Gez, uh, Arthur Gez, a colleague. A, a colleague. And uh, the idea is here that we're going to train a deep recurrent convolutional neural network to do, uh, it's trained by reinforcement learning. Um, and it's trained on Sokoban. And Sokoban is not the partially observed environment, so it's not clear where you would have memory. But here, the, again, the, the RNN is here to say, well, I, you can think more about this problem. So you can tick the RNN a few more times if it's somehow helpful in computing what looks to be, it's not Go, but Sokoban is classically placed on a, a, a planning problem. I don't know if everyone knows Sokoban is this game where a little alien needs to move boxes into target, but it cannot pull them. So if you get, a, for instance, a box stuck into a corner, you, that's it, you've lost uh, that particular game. It's fun. Uh, you, you can try. And so classically, RL would not do very, very well on this kind of environment, but on a distribution, particular distribution environments, which are decently challenging, you can get this to have like 99% accuracy, which other methods uh, don't. All right. And the last example, uh, probably the most successful one, is a technique from AlphaFold 2, the paper about protein folding from, from DeepMind, called recycling. And the idea of recycling is almost exactly the RNN that I explained. It basically says, OK, I want as big of a neural network as I can to predict the folded protein from its configuration. And you know, they made the neural network as big as they could. Right? So they cannot really train a bigger one. But at test time, they still want to say, well, I want you to spend more compute because folding is very hard. And so during training, they basically provided the best estimate so far. This is the second step. The best estimate so far of the folding as a side input to the same network. So now the network doesn't work just from the protein configuration, but from your best guess, so to speak. And then you still try to predict the actual folded protein that you have in your training data set. And you just do this, I think, up to three or four times. They do have a bunch of techniques to save on computation and memory. And uh, recycling was a very key ingredient of alpha to alpha fold to success. So it's not planning in the classical sense of research, but definitely has this aspect of, I'm at test time, I want better answers, so I'm going to try to spend more computation, laser-focused computation on the problem at hand. All right, so, so far, explicit planning, uh, the benefits can be typically trusted to scale very well because we know the underlying algorithm, NCTS, has theoretical guarantees. So unlike ticking an RNN, I know that the more I plan, the better I'm going to get. Uh, it may require learning a world model, which is hard, and it's quite compute hungry. The implicit planning and iterative refinement, it's more brittle because then the RNN learns some kind of algorithms. There is no guarantee whatsoever what happens when I unroll that RNN. Uh, it's potentially leveraging computation more efficiently. Uh, and the high level of vision for me is the design patterns much more than the specific. I want to make a brief call to uh, Rich Sutton's bitter lesson, if you know it. He has this position paper, which I recommend reading. I'll just read the, 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 the high level intuition is more flops at test time gets better results. So he says, and also during training, learning by self play and learning in general is like search in that it enables massive competition to be brought to bear. Search and learning are the two most important classes of techniques for utilizing massive amounts of computation in AI search. So any technique that allows you to spend more compute is something that we should look into. All right, so this was first half, so to speak. Five minutes, just about mid. It finishes at 12, right? Is that right? So it's exactly midway. Good. Any questions so far before I move on to the brave new world of LLMs? Otherwise, we can just. All right, we just move on then, I think. Yeah. OK, so again, let's start waxing a little bit more philosophical, even though I think this is a more tricky territory. So I'm not going to engage too much with the notion of what is reasoning. I think this is a better conversation to be had for a much longer talk. Um, but what is reasoning? What do people mean when they say reasoning? Um, so informally, reason is the capacity to unconsciously applying logic by drawing valid conclusions from new or existing information with the aim of seeking the truth. That's Wikipedia. Um, in the space of LLM, it has tended to mean the following. It tends to mean solving problems associated with deductive, deductive reasoning. So deductive reasoning is the process of drawing valid inferences. You know, you have base atoms of knowledge that you know, and rules that you know can be used to compose these atoms of knowledge into new atoms of knowledge. And you try to reach an atom of knowledge that is interesting and that you didn't have before. So in mathematics, you know, you start from axioms and rules about how to combine these axioms, and then you prove theorems which are increasingly more complicated, from the existence of natural numbers all the way to like whatever is your favorite hard uh, mathematical problem. 
so in the space of LM reasoning, I tended to mean problems associated with deductive reasoning, such as mathematical reasoning, problem solving. Often, it means problems for which the answer can be assertively proven to be correct. So it's not a matter of subjectivity. A theorem is either true or false, or maybe improvable. Uh, you know, this kind of code, either correct or incorrect, but there is no notion of as much of subjectivity. But this is, you know, not a official definition by any means, and we can talk more about what reasoning should mean. All right, so reasoning. Reasoning by chain of thought in particular. How many people in the room are familiar with ideas around chain of thought, just out of curiosity? Okay, actually not so many, so that's good, because I was afraid that this would be too clear. So uh, chain of thought. So I will uh, put a bunch of LLM interaction. Some of them are real, some of them I just type for, for the purpose of the talk to make it shorten them or make them more clear. Uh, so this is a kind of classical question, I think, that comes from a data set called GSMAK. It's kind of like a grade school mathematics. Uh, so in purple, again, the input, the question, and the answer will be in blue. So a cafeteria has 23 apples. If they use 20 to make lunch and bought six more, how many apples do they have? So I don't think this is true at all anymore, that if you ask an LM, it would answer like this for many reasons. But at some point, maybe, LM would answer right away and wrongly, say 27. No explanations, and it's wrong. Um, a chain of thought looks more something like this. Uh, how it would look like it actually reasons through the steps. The cafeteria had 23 apples originally. They used 20 to make lunch, so they have now 23 minus 20, which is 3. They bought six more apples, so they have 3 plus 6 equal to 9. They now have 9, and that's the correct answer. So in that output of the LLM, I would like to separate two bits. The, the second bit is the desired answer. I may or may not care about the explanation beforehand. Like maybe if, this, if I'm automating a system to do a counting or something, maybe I don't care about the reasoning that I'm going through. I just care about the answers, and I care that they are correct. So this is the desired answer, and this is what I want to be correct. The chain of thought is everything that comes before. It's sort of the natural language. I think I, so what it should show, it's the natural language computation or reasoning or argumentation that leads to the correct answer. So what is your thought? It's any utterance in natural language. This is not an official definition either. Uh, people use chain of thought very informally. So it's any utterance in natural language that supports the answer. How does it support the answer? In three possible ways. Uh, they can be not all at the same time, depending on which school of thought you belong to. One is it makes it more likely to be correct. So you would want this computation, your workings, to sort of support the fact that the LM is going to become more accurate give better answers when it uses a chain of thought by making, maybe making it interpretable. So you know this answer was uninterpretable, like why 27? Where does that come from? I mean, I cannot check it. I, I don't really know. Here we know maybe a huge debate of whether these are really revealing the inner workings of the LLM, but there is some sense of it's slightly more interpretable. So it can make it more interpretable. The last bit, which is a bit different from the first one, is by proving its correctness. So this chain of thought actually does both. This chain of thought led the agent to compute the correct answer, but it's also sort of a proof. If I parse it, it's natural language, but I parse it and I, I get convinced, oh yeah, it's the correct answer because I can check every step and I say every step is valid, so therefore the conclusion has to be valid. But you could have, you know, case there could be part of the chain of thought that is not about proving the correctness, just computing the correct answers. I will get back into this later. But these are actually distinct, I think. So this is a certificate that my answer is correct, and this is making it more likely that I compute the correct answer. All right, so how do we induce chain of thought? You know, here we have two outputs, and one of them was bad, and the other was good. So how could we induce a chain of thought and a good, a good one? Uh, first technique is a uh, few shot prompting. So as you know, LLMs are completion machine. You give them a partial conversation, and then they complete it. So in this case, uh, this is from a very influential paper by Wei and all, Chain of Thought Prompt Elicits Reasoning in Large Language Models. It has a question and an answer that includes the chain of thought in the input prompt, and then another question which doesn't have the answer, right? So it says, Roger has five tennis balls, he buys two more kinds of tennis balls, each can has three. How many does he have now? Five plus two times three is six. Uh, five and six is 11, the answer is 11. And then it asks a question that he actually cares about. And so now, because of the imitation that LLMs tend to have, this thing called in-context learning, it's going, it's going to imitate the reasoning it's so in the first example. And so now it, it kind of argues in a similar way. And there's a lot of different ways you can prompt. This is a particular way, but any technique that you think you can come up with to approach this kind of problem, you can use in an input you know, and a demonstration and see if it affects the accuracy on held out examples. So that's the first technique, few shot prompting. 
The second one is, I would say, just instruction. Just tell it to do something. So there's this paper, large angle rolls are zero shot reasoner. So it's the same again, our good old tennis ball problem. And then we start the answer for the LLM. Uh, this requires access to uh, an inner working of the API that might not be able, but this is basically I edit the answer of the LLM to start by saying, let's think step by step. And then it's in a completion machine, and so it's complete, and it actually starts talking. And then that paper came out, I think it was very surprising, uh, because just adding this little single sentence increased accuracy quite significantly. It feels like, wait, why? Uh, but nevertheless, it worked. Now you probably don't need to tell LLMs to think step by step, because this has sort of been internalized by, by training. Um, though it does change your behavior still. Um, of course, if you cannot control the answer, which you can't in many APIs for good reason, because it allows you to, for instance, go the LLM in doing something bad, like let me start by something not real and toxic and whatever, and then it would sort of execute. So as users, we tend to only be able to edit the, the question part, but you can still put it in a question that still works. Maybe not as well, but it still works. You could also give it more precise instruction. Let's think step by step is a very high level one that doesn't have a lot of details, but maybe I have a particular algorithm, so to speak, in mind for solving a problem. So this is a real interaction I tried yesterday. Uh, how many ping pong balls fit in a 747? It's estimated, and the answer, it answers straight off the cuff, no explanation. It estimated 500 million, give or take, could fit into a Boeing. Um, people think this is a reasonable answer. It's hard to tell, actually. As I said, you know, without the reasoning trace, we don't have a certificate of correctness. This is wrong. Uh, it's quite badly wrong, actually. The real number, I mean, this is a kind of interview problem, is about 7 million, apparently. So this is off by two orders of magnitude. Or 10 million, so one order, I guess. All right, if I told the LLM uh, this, I, I said this. So I gave it the ingredients to the solution here. To be clear, this is not a very general prompt. But I gave it the algorithm I want to execute. To find the answer, first estimate the volume of a ping pong ball, treating as a sphere. Estimate the volume of 747, treating as a cylinder. Recall the density of packing, then conclude. And this is actually the answer of the LM, which starts to, you can see the chain of thought, it's, this is no chain of thought, and this is actually a very long answer, where it goes to every step of the instructions, estimate the volume, and this is actually pretty clean. Uh, I think the volume of 747 is optimistic, it might not, I forget exactly why, uh, but it comes up with the answer of, I think, 40 million, which is a whole order of magnitude away from the previous guess, which is much more correct. So, you know, that's another way to induce a chain of thought, is to tell it what method you want it to kind of unravel in its scratch pads, so to speak. All right, the third technique, and I'm gonna go more into this in, in a bit, is, and I, you've learned a lot from SFT and fine-tuning models from Thomas when he talked about LLMs, but it's basically from SFT data. So this is an example problem from a famous math data set called Hendrix, Hendrix Map, which is quite challenging. It's not like, you know, IMO level, but it's, it's not completely trivial. Uh, sorry, there's a square here missing. The equation x squared plus 2x is equal to i has two complex solution determine the product of the real part. And maybe here, actually, as it happens in some examples of that data set, I have the whole reasoning trace. I don't have just the answer, but I have the reasoning trace. So there is this example, I think, is in a data set, complete the square. I mean, we don't need to go through the example, but it takes the steps to solve the problem and get the correct answer, which is 1 minus root 2 over 2. All right, so then very quickly, um, 30, 30 more minutes, right? Yeah. Very quickly, a reprimer of how to do SFT, I take my question and my answer, I tokenize them, so now I have two sequences of tokens, which are just like integers. I feed both of these to my causal transformer. So this little uh, banded arrows means I only look at the past. It's, it's a causal, it's a tra most transformers are causal these days. And I compute using uh, the chain rule, the log probability of the answer given the question. LMs may look very different from what we we're doing before, but in a sense, it is just supervised learning when the input and the output space are quite high dimensional collections of token. And because LLMs transformers are designed to be computed autogressively, I can decompose this log prob as a sum of next token prediction. Often people say next token prediction is meaningless. I'm not saying it's the right training pattern, but it technically loses nothing. You can express any distribution autogressively. Is is that, do we learn the right one? Does it generalize and so on? That's a separate question, but there is no fundamental limitation to next token prediction, which I think is a common misconception about LM. So we compute the log probability of each token as a function of all the previous tokens. And we only compute that probability for the answer, because I want to reinforce the answer. I'm not trying to predict the question. I'm trying to predict the answer as a function of the question. So this gives me a score. And oops, sorry, it went backwards. And then we just compute the gradient and update the weights. OK, so that's it. And the weight, the weight of dates is the gradient of the log prob of the answer given the question. All right, so this is something that we can do uh, if we have the data for it. 
moving on to uh, learning to reason. Okay, so what do I mean by this? In this example I gave you, you had the answer that included everything I needed. It had the chain of thought, it had the correct answer, so I can learn to predict it, this is great. But what if we don't have the answer? Right? A lot of problems, I don't have the answer. Or another common situation is what if I have the final answer? I just gave you, well, the answer is one minus root two over two, but I don't know the reasoning. I don't know you came up with that statement. I tell you a theorem is true. Often this is our math you know, problems are like prove this so you know it's true, but you don't really know how to get there. Or you have lots of textbook where you have the answer keys, but you don't really have the reasoning. Okay, so what could I do if I didn't have the reasoning? Or another case is what if we could check our answers? So I have a magical machine here that can take an answer and check if it's correct or not, but I don't have the answer. So what do I do here? Um, so third, I just want to reseparate. So what I started, I want to reseparate this this kind of uh, completion of the dilemma into what I'm going to call the rest of the talk, the thought, which is the stuff, the chain of thought, the stuff that is not technically the thing that I care about, but that supports the answer, and the actual answer, one minus root two over two. Okay, and I'm going to go through another pattern. Uh, it's called self-improvement through answer checking. This is found in a number of papers. The paper I'm going to be most closely to is Star Self-Taught Algorithmic Reasoner. Bootstrapping Reasoning with Reasoning by Zelikman et al. There is other very similar paper called V-Star, Reinforced Self-Training for Language Modeling, Beyond Human Data, Scaling Self-Training for Problem Solving in Large Language Models, and many, many, many other papers. This is a very active research area, so there is a lot of variance. Uh, but the high-level ideas are all, I would say, quite similar. All right, so how does that work? I'm going to do it entirely picturally. Suppose you have a data set of questions and just the answers, but not the thought. So what do I do? And I have an LLM. So what I do is I send the question, only the question, to the LM, and I ask it to generate completion, generate thoughts and answers. So I hear I have three. Thought one, answer one, thought two, answer two, thought three, answer two. Then I'm going to use my gold answer, the reference answer, and by using a little custom piece of code, I'm going to check for the correctness of each of my generations. So maybe in this case, A1 was wrong, A2 was correct, and A3 was wrong. And I'm going to assume, I, I can't really score the reasoning itself, but I'm going to assume the underlying assumption of this algorithm is the reasoning is as correct as it leads to correct answers. This is the essence of correct reasoning, is that it leads to correct answers all or most of the time. And so once I'm done this, I basically filter for only the thought answers which were correct. And I make a new data set. My previous data set was question and answers. And now my new data set is the uh, data set of questions, correct thoughts and answers. Again, under the assumption correct thought means an answer, uh, a thought that led to an answer that was equivalent to the gold reference one. And then I do SFT on that new data set. So now I have a data set that has thoughts, I just do a set of that, and I have a better agent, and this works. Uh, of course, we can iterate. I started from a base model, and I did a bit of this kind of, I did created a new new data set, and I fine tune, I have a better agent. But no, I could generate, I could start from here and generate my new answers from the slightly more mathematically capable agent. So I can replace the left agent by the right agent, and just keep, just like in alpha zero, there's this notion of self-improvement, uh, you can do the same thing, and so the agent increasingly gets better and better at solving more and more problems until it's like super good. Okay, so there is a limitation here, which may like, does that take us all the way to like solving everything in the world? Well, no, because its ability to self-improve is limited by the initial data set it starts from. So eventually, maybe it solves everything in the training set, and well, once you have solved all the problems in your grade school mathematics, maybe you need a high school level book of mathematics and uh, university and so on. So you know, that has you know, I don't want to oversell it, but this this works. Okay, so. The results are, for the rest EM paper, this number of iterations, and again, this is the performance under XMath, and for a particular model, which I think is palm large, you start, yes, palm large, which is an ancient, more ancient LLM. Um, start at Hendrix math at 35%, and then you end up, I think this is close to 45, so you get about roughly 10% improvement, and you even show transfer, so the SMAK is another data set, which is easier. As you can see, it starts higher at 80%, and training at Hendrix Math does lead to transfer to another. So this is not just getting good at that particular data set, but maybe a notion of general capability about reasoning. All right, so that's results. I want to demystify self-improvement as being magnesis. Is this magic? It's, it's not magic in the sense it's just RL. It's RL and LLM with a grounded reward. So we consider the following setup. You have, it's going to be a, basically a bandit. I'm going to call it RL, but let's call it RL. You have an observation, which is a Q function. There's a hidden state that you don't get to see when you act, which is the reference answer A star. Of course, if you have the answer, you just regurgitate the answer, but that's not what we want. You take an action, which is just sampling a big blob of tokens which represent your thoughts and the answer. Your policy is the LLM. Given a question, generate 
a thought on an answer. And my turn will reward, is only a reward that comes at the very end, is just check the answer that you generate, check it against the reference answer is star, give you a separate reward of one if they're equivalent and zero otherwise. So what did that look like if I did policy gradient? So we recall the equations without a baseline that Claire gave for policy gradient. The way that uh, policy gradient looks like, it's sort of like a weighted form of supervised learning. I'm, I'm assuming that my generation is x, and so I do the grad log prob of x given q. If x was my goal answer, this would just be supervised learning. But I weighted by the reward. And as it happens, the reward is one or zero, so it just becomes grad log theta of the log quality of the answer given q if a is correct. This is what this term on the left becomes for this particular setup. And that is exactly the same as saying I want to do SFT on successful traces. So SFT on successful traces, in a sense, is policy gradient for this particular RL setup. So this is the way it works. This is why policy self-improvement, so to speak, is just policy iteration and so on. So there's no magic. So it works well, uh, is, you know, the fundamentals apply whether your model is like tabular or whether it's big LLM. I want to point out one thing which is very important. This reward is a very particular setup where it depends on the gold answer. This is fine for a training, but cannot be used for planning at test time. Because obviously that would mean that at test time I know the answer and this is not what you want to do. You want at test time to deploy this agent on problems on which the answer is not given to it, otherwise it just has to repeat. Okay, so in the last little bit of time, actually we're doing okay, I want to talk a bit, tie the two knots together. We talked a bit about planning, we talked a bit about self-improvement and LM, and so I want to put them together and say, can we plan with LM? Okay, so first, planning, I'm going to do more the explicit planning. I'll mention implicit planning with LM in a little bit, but let's do the explicit kind of multi-step one first. So a lot of planning is almost by construction multi-step. If you only have one step ahead, it's not really, you don't really see into the future. You just have to choose the best action. So two limitations of star to address before going further. The action is the response, TA. It's treated single step. So how do we turn this into a multi-step problem so I can progressively construct my solution as opposed to brom, I sample an answer and I just to see if it's good or bad. So that's the first question we can answer. The second one is the terminal reward, as I said, requires the ground truth information. It is not available at test or deployment time. And another problem from an RL learning perspective, it comes at the very end. I, maybe, you know, these problems are short, but if it was a long problem, I'm gonna like do a lot of calculations and lots of thinking and do that. And at the end, I come up with an answer and you just tell me, no, it's wrong, but I don't know why. I don't have any credit about what did I do early that was wrong, you're just like, oh, it sucked. And so this is not a very dense learning signal, which makes it hard to learn for long traces, which should be more commonly associated with the hard problems that are the ones we really want to. Okay, so first, step decomposition. This is easy. Do whatever you want. Uh, so it, it, a common thing to do is to say, well, you know, this is a completion. I'm just gonna call each step basically what comes after maybe an equation or after a period. It's whatever you want it to be. So in this case, I've decided to decompose this into these three steps, the first step of reasoning, the second step of reasoning, and the third step, which includes the answer. So this decomposition is arbitrary. By arbitrary, I mean any choice can be used and the theory will still apply. So for instance, you could do it at the token level. You could say every token is some, every step is sampling a single token. That's pretty wild because then you have a very long horizon. Or you can use different delimiters. What's commonly done, I would say here, is to use a period. You know, periods in natural language have historically served to separate chunks of meaning and so it sort of makes sense that every step of reasoning should all be more or less delimited by punctuation. But this is a bit arbitrary, and if you have better ideas, you should investigate. Um, I say it's arbitrary because the theory will apply, but it will have a significant effect on results, doing the right thing and the wrong thing, so to speak. You know, if you plan with token level, I mean, you're gonna spend an insane amount of compute before getting any kind of answer, so I do not recommend it, but maybe I'm wrong. I'm sure there's some people who's doing that. Okay, so we've fixed the first problem by saying every step is a sentence. And then LM scan sample sentence by sentence. You don't need to sample, sample the whole thing. So send me one sentence, then the next one, the next one, and then it tells you I'm done. There's no, nothing more to say. The second bit is the terminal reward, the fact that it's ground truth and it's sparse. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, a way to fix that. All right. So I'm going to work through this example a lot. It's simple, uh, but let's try to work to it together to make sure that we have it in our mind for a lot of the next few slides. So uh, let's say, there's very simple math riddle, the denominator of a fraction is seven less than three times its numerator. If the fraction is equivalent to two over five, what's the numerator of the fraction? 
can tell you the ground truth answer is 14. And here is a good reasoning. Let's call the denominator x. I said the denominator is 7 less than 3 times the denominator, so the denominator is 2x over minus 7. We know the fraction is equivalent to 2 over 5, so x divided by 3x minus 7 is 2 over 5. If I multiply by 5 on this side and 3x minus 7 on the other one, I get 5x is equal to 6x minus 14. I cancel 6 minus 5, 1x is equal to 14. Congratulations, your answer matches the ground truth answer. This is a good reasoning trace. This is why it is called an outcome reward model. It only gives you a reward on the outcome of the sample of the LLM. Okay, so let's look at another trace, which is for the same problem. X equal to 3x minus 7. We know that the division is equal to 5 over 2. And here, for whatever reason, the LLM, the student made a mistake. We said it was equal to 2 over 5, not 5 over 2. So this is a mistake. So this step, even though it's sort of correctly follows from this one, uh, is invalid, and the conclusion is invalid, and you get a reward of zero. But it would be nice, instead of just saying, this is all a bunch of nonsense, to be able to tell at what moment did it go wrong. And this is another example of a bad trace. In this one, what did I do? Uh, I did a bad multiplication. I multiplied both that side by 2 instead of by 2 and 5. That'll be important because I want to get back into this in a second. So let's look at this one, the one where I did the 2 of uh, this one, where I basically wrongly simplified this. I would like to be able to tell the model, well, this was fine, and this was fine, and this was fine, but this was bad. If x over 3x minus 7 is 2 over 5, then you shouldn't have 2x. Where did the 2 come from? It's supposed to be 5x. The 6 minus 7 is fine, but the 2x is wrong. So I want to tell you, like, no, don't, don't. you can do this. This is fine, but this sucks. And therefore, this, I think this is debatable. Is this good or bad? It's a correct conclusion that flows from a false premise. Um, we can debate. Uh, for this other example, where I just wrongly reported 2 over 5 and a 5 over 2, the, the mistake was done earlier. It was at the third stage. And this is what is called the process reward model. It's a denser signal that tries to tell you a signal about whether your steps of thinking are correct instead of just the final one. OK, so how do we learn a process reward model? Um, I'll take, uh, I, I'll present two approaches, sort of mimicking the AlphaGo to AlphaZero process of starting from human data and going by uh, imitate self, self play. The first approach is supervised approach. It's simple. Just ask people to look at these traces and tell, you know, record the data set of when it went wrong. This is good, this is good, and I can tell the model this is bad. Okay, so I collect this data, and then I do SFT on traces. So this is a, a trace for a reward model where the input to the LLM is, okay, this question, the partial trace so far, and for, you know, you do it for every partial trace, and then you'd, SF, you'd predict a single token, maybe a, the sentence, but saying process reward is meh for this one. And for the correct one, I would say this is correct. And I just have a new data set. I can do SFT on it. And now I have a model. Maybe it's a separate model, but I have a model that can ask this kind of question and say, hey, score every step of the way. You know, you start from this, give it the first step, score it. If it says thumbs up, you continue. Otherwise, you backtrack, basically. All right, so this is the supervised approach. It makes sense, but it requires human data. What if I wanted to do a self-supervised approach? Well. We call them PRMs, but they really are value function. Principles always live on. And so the way it works is that I take a question and a partial trace. So you see, I haven't finished my reasoning. And I want to see, how am I doing so far? Is this on the right track, or does it suck? Because that's what I want to use. I can't unroll my tree until the end of my beam search. I need to have an early signal of whether this is going well or not. And so the way it's going to work is I'm going to do multiple completion with the answers of this bit. So I, you know, I didn't put it here, but maybe I have one completion. And it gives me 14. Another comp this is correct trace so far, by the way. So I give a completion and an answer, which is 14. Another one, the answer is 14. And the last one, the answer is 7. And so then I score them with a ground truth answer. And I say, well, 2 thirds of them are correct. And so then I learn to predict that number. It's exactly a value function. I learn to predict how likely is it that given this partial reasoning trace, I'm going to end up with the correct answer. And hopefully, this model will generalize to reasoning traces it has not seen. And then we predict, as I said, uh, the average success. SFT. So here, in this case, I call it a reward because the field calls it a reward. It's a value function. OK, so now uh, I'm going to talk briefly before concluding on planning with LLMs. So a bunch of papers on this topic, but this is unexplored territory, largely. So how do we do planning with MCT LLM and MCTS? Uh, I'll present a simplified version of this paper, Alpha Math Almost Zero. In spite of the name, it's not a DeepMind paper. I think it's from Baidu. 
uh, where on the left you have your tree search for Go. And so, you know, what do you do? Well, you do exactly the same thing. Don't need to, I mean, almost exactly the same thing. So you go from a tree search where you have actions, you have nodes, same thing. The only difference is what are the actions. An action here is sampling a step of thinking. Of course, there is a very large number of them, even more infinitely, arguably, or certainly even more than Go moves. So you have to be a bit clever about which nodes you add. But it's fundamentally not very different from CTS. We guide building the tree with a prior, which is the LLM, and we build value function using the PRM to say, oh, is this going? Is this going well? Do I need to backtrack and so on? So here's an example of what it could look like. Uh, so I have this thing, you know, question, and I start the first step, and my PRM says, good. And then next step, next, good. Third step, this is when I did my mistake of copying the tour of five and five or two. So the PRM says, nah. So you have built your tree deep, and then you say, okay, no, this is bad. I need to backtrack. I'm simplifying things a bit, but I think this is the gist. So I backtrack, and I say, okay, fine. I'm going to try to sample another node. And this other node could be, well, it's 2 over 5. And now the PRM says, yeah, that's fine. This is good. Now I do another step. This is good. And from the last step, I conclude wrongly. The PRM says, you can apply the PRM the last step. It does not require the dual truth model, which is something desirable about it, because it means you can do it at test time on a problem you've never seen, for which you don't have the answer. And the PRM says, no, 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 no. This is the last step, maybe, but this last step is wrong. It is, it, you should have said 14, not 7, so it's bad. Backtrack once more, and then conclude 14. Congratulations, the search has sort of given you the right solution. OK, so this may seem simple, or not, I don't know, but it seems like maybe the problem itself is simple. This is not a very challenging problem. And is it really likely that we need to backtrack? Probably the LLM can sample the answer. Do we really need this? We need this tree search fanciness, right? This seems maybe overkill. Uh, I cannot give too much details, but I will, um, you know, there's this blog post that came about from DeepMind's results on the IMO. If you know what IMOs are, there are challenges that high schoolers take on mathematics. It's very challenging. It's not just like, oh, I'm good at math, I can do the IMOs. You, you train for two years, and, and then it's still very difficult. Uh, I, you know, yeah, it, it's it definitely like a, not doable by most people unless you train for it for a very long time. And so, Without getting the details of how it works, you know, there is this fundamental idea of applying alpha zero and LLM to give access to formal groups. And this is actually our considerably difficult problems. But yet somehow the combination of search and learning and LLM gives you very strong result. Very strong result, as in almost getting a gold medal, like a confident silver medal, shy of your points of a gold medal on the IMO. All right, so. I'm about just on time. What did I not mention? Um, first one is, why does Chirno Thought help? So I'm happy to talk to all of you or answer questions for whatever question time we have. Why does the chain of thought help? Uh, why do we need this? Why don't we just predict the correct answers from the question? Why, do we, why does the LLM need to blab about it? Uh, so there's, you know, I put some references here, but there's a paper, why think step by step, reasoning emerges from the collective experience. I think the intuition of that paper, very briefly, is that during pre-training, the model learns a lot about kind of simple transitions, the single steps of reasoning. And, but it, there is a large number of single steps, but there is even more long steps, almost by construction. A long step of reasoning is composed of composing single steps of reasoning. And basically, there is no guarantee that if, it's a, if you ask a question which corresponds to a long chain of reasoning, it has never seen it. So it may answer completely wrong. But it may have seen all the individual components of that chain of reasoning. And so forcing it to output those steps allows it to compose these bits of knowledge that it has seen and get to the correct answer, which you would not be able to do without getting there. And this is very, I, maybe I'm anthropomorphizing the LLM, but this is very similar to the experience that we get, right? When you give me a hard problem, I sort of start from what I know and try to work out something. It's not to be math. I've talked a lot about math. But any reasoning problem, including soft, uh, softer fields, would definitely have this aspect of, let me see what I know. How do I, how do, I do a talk? You know, how do I decompose it? And, and so on. Um, linearized search, so the idea that LM does not necessarily build an explicit tree, because a tree, sure, it's a tree. It's a fancy structure. But it can be linearized in the sense of you can sort of make trace of what you've tried and the backtrack, you know, let me backtrack now, and so on. And instead of maybe imposing this complex data structure, which lives outside of the LM, maybe it should be the LM itself that builds it. And so there's this. If we call streams of search, learning to search in language, I can't at all. Um, one thing I wish I had time to talk about, but I don't, is reflection and self-criticism. So this is definitely the LLM coming up with an answer. And instead of having this very particular behavior for editing, which is backtracking and going forward, just takes the answer as a whole and mutates it into something that is better. Now, it looks at an answer, reflects on it, like makes a criticism of it. And based on the criticism of the first answer, revises it into a second answer, and so on and so on. So this is some sort of 
if you're a Bayesian at heart, the MCMC to the MCTS that I just talked about. Uh, tool use, I mean, of course, you would say, well, you know, there's a lot of problems that LMs are not good at, like arithmetic, and yeah, sure, there's no reason that you can't reason using tools. I can solve simple math problems by hand, linear programs uh, by hand, but if I'm gonna solve a big one, I'm for sure I'm gonna start Python, right? And it's not because I can't solve it by hand, as it would take me forever, and it would probably make mistakes. Uh, so there's no reason that the LM cannot do tool use. There's a lot of paper on tool use, and many, 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 many other ideas. Um, I'll skip this bit, and I'll finish by saying um, that space of reasoning whether uh, and planning, whether it's with LLM or without, has still a lot of unexplored ideas. There's still a lot of low-hanging fruits. Uh, I think it's an exciting space to work in, so I think you, know, you should definitely feel empowered to go explore and have fun and you know, play with lots of ideas. Um, I also want to add one bit, which is that you know, sometimes there's this perception that this research can only be done in big lab. You need big LLMs, but LLMs happens in big lab because you need the compute. A lot of the papers that I mentioned, not all, but have been developed in academic labs on small experiments. STAR, which is an excellent paper, uh, was developed at Stanford. I mean, there's probably the reference in the paper of how much compute they use, but they did it on simple data sets because they couldn't scale it to like massive stuff. Uh, but the principle was good, right? So, you know, it was, it was a good idea. And, and RESTM, which is a very similar ID, which is simultaneous, then was scaled up to bigger data set. So proving that the idea was good. But, you know, you don't need absolutely, like, tons of compute to do research in that space. Limitations, very briefly. Um, is this really reasoning, or is this just, like, LLM, you know, pretending, simulating something that looks like reasoning but isn't? Uh, I won't have time to go through that paper, a notable critic of LLM about reasoning and planning, someone that comes from the more classical planning community, Subaru, has a paper, I think it's literally called Can LLM Reasons and Plan, is negative on it. I'll just give his argument and I won't talk too much about it, but it says, it says to summarize, nothing that I have read, verified, or done gives me any compelling reason to believe that LLMs do reasoning or planning as normally understood. What they do instead, armed with web scale training, is a form of universal approximate retrieval, which as I've argued can sometimes be mistaken for reasoning capabilities. I would encourage you to look at the talk or read the paper if you're curious. On a personal level, I, I, I mean, often they, they, when these are arguments, there are arguments much more about language than they are about the actual specifics. Um, you know, there's an argument about what's true planning and so on. And for him, the fact that the algorithm is not guaranteed to scale arbitrarily is a fundamental limitation. And it looks, it may look like planning, it isn't. I think it's certainly the case that the LLM reasoning is brittle. It's also at times very impressive. And you know, the fact that it's brittle, I mean, my reasoning is brittle, it's extremely brittle. So I'm not, and I cannot solve SAP problems with one million variables. So in that sense, by his arguments, uh, I'm not reasoning, or I'm not planning either, which I think is quite accurate. Um, so I think it's, it's an interesting question, an interesting debate. I don't want you to come with this talk as the conclusion like LMs can definitely reason and plan. I think it's for you to decide what reasoning and planning means. And, but certainly the space is interesting. There's a lot more research and he himself Anchorage on the idea of combining LLMs with classical planners, which I think is what he, he wants to stay, is this algorithm of, of leveraging the, the, search, the research that has been done in classical planning as opposed to subsuming it into the LLM, which is a fair argument. Um, um, yeah, five minutes, I think. Thank you. Uh, I have a long bibliography that you can read after in your own time, but with this, I am done with my talk, and feel free to ask any questions now or later.